Good morning. I thought that I would come back to the oldest form of medicine using the hands. I was attracted to osteopathic medicine because of the hands. And my goal in life was to connect my brain and my hands through the heart. I've been on a 30 year journey and I'm still trying to move forward. This year when we welcomed the first class for the 2018 class, I had the audacity to take one of the students in the audience to come up on stage with all the faculty. And I first asked all the students to get up, shake hands left and right, and then I asked them if they could tell me the eye color of the partner. Naturally, they didn't do it, but I told them it was the first thing that they learned, a physical examination. At that moment, I shook Aaron's hand, the student's hand. Everybody saw it. Then I put on my white coat, the doctor's coat, and I shook the hand again back and forth and a little longer. And then I said, by the way, I can feel you. Did you have an ankle injury recently? The left ankle. Silence. Students were mesmerized. And they said, did he tell you? And I said, no. I watched them walk up the stairs. And my goal in life as a physician is to watch, to listen. And I use the hands as the additional tool to do that. Now, when I am with a patient, my goal is to talk and listen, to get a dialogue. And my goal is to fix that patient, but more to make her or him well, so that I don't have to fix her or him again, because that's the real thing a physician should do. So when I now go back and say what we do, it is really I watch motion. I myself see myself as a detective, a fine mechanic of body motion to find out where things go awry, where they don't talk to each other anymore. And when you look at this acrobatics of an unexpected motion of a soccer player who is just about to land and fall, but then will stretch out the hand and break that fall so that we can clap because that ball went into the goal, that's something that twists the body but stays there. And I find out that this young man practices these things. I got photographs to prove it. So his body is twisted. And if something goes awry, I am going, hopefully, to detect it when the patient comes to me. So we have all of this perfect, what I call resonance, the topic harmonics, tectonics. We should sound correctly. The body has its vibrations, its pulsations, its rhythms. And if I go and approach the patient from this end, I learn to listen how the patient's chest movements go. How often do we move our breath in and out a day? How many times? Give me a number. About 24,000 times. Wow. Now let's go to another vibration that I have. It is the heart. The heart is not just this pump. It pumps out structurally, and then it disseminates everything all the way down to the fingertips, down to my toes, and actually, hopefully, to my brain somewhere. All these reverberations, they are taking place while we don't even think about it. So when I put my hand on a patient, what's going to happen is I feel these reverberations. I've learned to train my hands to listen. It goes up and down, and then I feel the heartbeat a little bit like this, and then I feel a little peristalsis going on, and all of a sudden I feel a little twitch because the muscle fibers twitched one way, and I go like this. As things go on, all of a sudden I'm forgetting the world. I will tell you it took me about 20 years to admit to myself that actually I can feel a patient's body rhythm. And I didn't believe it that I would be able to do it because I was, I call, nebulized by thinking I would have to think drugs. I was thinking that it has to fit into the heart, into the lungs. We have now cardiology, we have nephrology, we have pulmonology. We've dissected, literally like the anatomy development, our body into compartments, rubricized it. And this is how we approach patients, think about it. I'm trying to read the entire organism using the hand 
of getting these vibrations back and forth. But it's more than just these vibrations. I'm really now trying to bring these hands together. By putting them on a patient, I'm starting this dialogue. I'm starting to listen. What is she or he saying to me right now? And I've trained, and th th there's nothing more sensitive than the hands on your entire body. Your ear may come close to it, or maybe perhaps equal. It's difficult to have the same, what I call, nuancization, able to take it apart with the visual stimulation. But the ears hear it. A good trained musician can get the harmonics, understands when there is this disharmony there. They can pick it up even out of a good concert. I think with training, and we now, let me just finish the study, that indeed if we train students to palpate, to learn to listen with the hands, that actually you get better. We have now an objective data that shows it because otherwise nobody believes you. Even though it's a simple, arg uh, simple experiment, we just got it hopefully published in the next few months. Um, so when you learn to listen with these fingers, but also with the whole hand, I'm listening not just to these vibrations that I'm getting here, but what I'm listening is what drives this body. And let me give you another example. When I was a student, my mentor, he said, examine this, this patient. So I walk in and I was miniaturized because I was at Michigan State, it was a lineman. And you know, I looked up, I looked around and I realized, whoa, how am I going to proceed with this 350 pound person? And I asked what the problem was and came in because of right shoulder pain. And I said, okay, I'll do my good shoulder exam, blah, blah, blah. Now, I said, that's it, I don't know what else to do. I go out and he couldn't do this, he couldn't do this. And it's, it's hard, if you can't move your shoulder during a game, shh, out you are. So then my mentor said, okay, now let me show you what I found. And he went through the usual examination, had put his hand ahead uh, on the patient and found out the problem was not the shoulder. It was distant at the left sacroiliac joint, right around here where the spine comes together with the, with the hip bone. And what had happened is that area was stuck after a fall. He was able to diagnose it because it didn't move really anymore. There was no resonance. The tissues didn't flow, it was a blockage right there. So what he then did is he treated this mechanically and within two visits, this young man went back to having no shoulder, but more importantly, had full range of motion and strength. When I tested that left side that he had fallen on, I could push when he lay on the table back with my two fingers the entire leg down. On the right side, I could hang on it and nothing would happen. So I learned the lesson that through the touch and by using a little bit of a brain, you make connections. And we heard this earlier. When we have a problem in the back, look in the front. When we have a problem in the top, look in the bottom. And this is how I learned to listen to the body in a way that really should go and speak with and back to you. But it's more than just these vibrations. And when the first speaker this morning spoke with these beautiful illustrations, that he uses a little wiggle, a little movement. That's exactly what I do. When I put my hand under the shoulder, I induce a force vector and want to see how these tissues now talk back to me. And if I wiggle them a little bit, I can see, okay, they vibrate or they don't vibrate. And then I can go to another part of the body and I've learned to listen, ah, here they should do more, etc. And then I find the problem really is in the right shoulder. But then I'm going to ask, do you have indigestion? And I'm going to go back by a logical neuroanatomic connection because the right shoulder pain may actually be a gallbladder problem because the gallbladder is innervated at the same level all of the stuff goes back out because the muscle now gets contracted and I feel it and if it feels kind of bland etc I say oh this could be actually a, a, a gallbladder problems and patients wonder how I can make those kind of diagnoses it's not a miracle I can teach it our students can learn this and this is what I think needs to happen in the transformation in medical education. That our students need to be told, think outside the box. Do something that you want to do in a way that you've not been rubricized and packaged up into this just spitting back information. Because when I try to touch a patient, 
the patient needs to feel that I'm communicating and giving something to her or him. Now let's go back. We now say personalized medicine. In a few years, not foreseeable, in the foreseeable future, you may go to your doctor and you may bring a lab print out that you got at the pharmacy down the street because that one drop, that's all it takes, you give it there and for very little money you have the whole printout. You may even print out a whole genome or exome and it tells you of all the possibilities of what you could have genetically wrong with you. That's going to happen. But what has to happen there is you have to bring it back individually what that means for the individual. How that person is being touched by that information and how the lifestyle, the sitting, the turning, the twisting, all of those things, how warm temperature or uh, stress strains, how all that influences it. So the hand to me becomes then the translator. The hand becomes the detective to find out where things don't resonate anymore. Where the hand then tells me, oh, there is this blockage, there is a disharmony. And look at the word, and I believe language is wonderful. It's a wonderful guide because we handle things. We grasp a situation by the touch. In the German word treatment, which means Behandlung, the word hand is in it. Treatment uses the hand to get there. Now when we go, if you think about it, another tectonic shift has been from the mystics towards the science and we're now down to this really most minicule thing, I know everything, the subatomic particles. But now we need to come back to the genome and then we need to say, okay, what and how does that affect you as a human being in the nature, in the tribe that Nate was just talking about? How do you fit in? And our medical students have to learn to think that way, to realize they are connected. They're giving something. And I need to speak up for them because I know the millennial and the Y generations, they've gotten a bad rap somewhere. But thank God to an article just in August in New York Times that says it's the nice generation. And I will tell you, I have absolute trust in that next generation. They are compassionate, they're empathic, they're confident, and they really want to learn. They don't mind their rigorous training. And with that regard, I feel we need to change not only healthcare, we need to change our educational system to a way to facilitate so that the dialogue can happen. And I think that dialogue can happen by engaging the hands and a handshake. So these are perhaps large tectonic shifts that we feel. I feel tectonic shifts when I go to the tissues. I'm a tissue reader, if you want, and I read not just the muscles or the bones, there's something called fascia, which is I call the saran wrap that goes around muscles, etc. We actually grow into it. When that gets stuck over here, then I'm going to try to overcompensate. And if you had a fall, and this is what surprises a lot of my patients, when I say, have you ever had a fall or something where the wind was knocked out of you? They say, oh yeah, that was 20 years ago. Then I say, wait a second. If you had a car accident 20 years and you had a blemish on the car, it doesn't fix by itself either. And so you actually work around it and carry this on. And I, with my hands, should be able to get additional information by twisting, by turning, by inducing a force vector that gives me a sense of what that body is, how it reverberates, how it vibrates, how it resonates, to get into harmony. And back into the language, when I talk about disease, it's not just disease on one end, it's dis-ease. My goal is to get ease out of the, the body with these reverberations. My next goal is not to get disability, but ability. I want to get away from the disharmony because, as we said earlier, we want to be synchronized. We have this natural tendency to work together well, to sound well. And that brings me back to the real most important part when I talk about personalized medicine. We all talk about it. But what does person mean? It comes, at least one of the definitions, from the Latin, personare. Listen, per sonare, per son, in French, son, the sound, to carry through your own sound. So my job is, that I want, you to, I want to make you as a patient sound. I want to make you healthy. And if I can do that, 
by any way of touching you in the most appropriate, clean, really artistic and scientific way. Don't you think we can really revolutionize a little bit of that healthcare system that right now is so stuck? And when I look at these tectonic changes that happen in education and the things that should happen in the healthcare system, let them clash. Because if the new things come out and are better, I think we'll have a better future. So what I'd like to do is just think a handshake can make you well. First it starts out by one person meeting one person, then the other person comes in, and as we really do it well, we start to resonate, to vibrate in harmony, and the tectonics and the harmonics will become a symphony. Thank you very much.